Um, yeah, I'm going to try and uh, condense sort of two years' worth of research and an 80-page <laughs> report into a few slides. So bear with me if it's a little bit all over the place, but we'll try to get through it. Um, the idea of ACRA, as, as, as we've been explaining before, is, is around, well, this phase is around helping people to, or decision makers, to plan for um, uncertainty and change, both in the short term and in the long term. Um, why is that important? Well, in principle, that understanding of the future, or a better understanding of the future, should help us in designing adaptation measures. It should help us in informing our development trajectories. Um, and we look to science. We look to science to tell us you know, what the future might look like, what the trends, how the trends are going, um, and, and what we can infer from those. Uh, if you look at the little graph there, that's, um, that's, a, that's a plot showing um, temperature change between the average temperature now and what we would expect in 2100 for Mozambique. You can just make that out. Um, what you can see from that is it's a pretty strong signal around a two to three degree rise <coughs> between now and 2100. Um, and that information is useful. You know, it's, it's pretty coarse, but decision makers in Mozambique can make uh, useful decisions around pot potential trade-offs, particularly around issues of agriculture. If there are particularly sensitive crops, um, sensitive to temperature, then that's something that you can take into account. The problem with plots like this, though, is that it hides a lot of the uncertainties. Um, so yes, if you're using a global model like this, you can tell you know, nice little, nice little pic pictures like this can tell a story. If we want to zoom down to the local level where it's actually very important, you know, this is where adaptation decisions get taken, um, it tells us very little. These sort of regional models don't give uh, the kinds of information that we need on the timescales that we need. They also hide the, the, the kind of uncertainties that go with it, so, or, or the kind of the variations that go with, with a projection of a map like that. So this is exactly the same inputs that would go into that map. It shows the different scenarios from the low, sort of uh, the, the best case scenario in a sense, which is the 2.6 scenario, all the way up to 8.5, which is our kind of doom and gloom scenario in a sense. Um, and we've got everything from a one degree rise up into a, uh, about an average of a five at 2100. So you've got a huge amount of variation there. What does, it, what does a national decision maker and even a local decision maker do with this information? So all that to say that, that change and uncertainty really are at the heart of development, right? Deve the development sector has to embrace this. We have always had to, and we will continue to. Some of the trends that are going to happen um, are more predictable than others. And interestingly, if we look temperature there, is probably one of the, the, the factors that we can model more accurately uh, or have a better understanding for in the future than something like rainfall. So even that, even with this uncertainty that I've shown you, that's considered relatively good. Um, but it's not just climate that we have to consider, there are others as well. Population change, um, economic growth, urbanization, all of these will interact. So understanding the future, both in terms of what we do know and what we can't know, is really important. With all this sort of around us as well, we have to, we have to maintain that the development sector as a whole, if we reflect on ourselves internally, um, can be seen to be relatively short term in our delivery and our outcomes. Um, uh, and it doesn't really matter if we're looking at governments or NGOs. Uh, all of them, we, you know, this, these traits are common to all. Um, if we're looking at, say, central government planning for Africa and for much of Africa, for much of South Asia, three to five year timescales are the norm. That gets passed down to local governments, and you set targets. Most of those targets assume that a normal year will happen. There's no contingency for a shock or a stress, a massive flood. Um, this is common for governments, but it's also common for NGOs, for the way that we fund our programs. Um, so we've got a bit of an issue here, that, that which is where Accra was trying to, to enter into. Um, and all of this sort of background is, is really highlighting the need, therefore, to help promote um, decision-making that is more flexible, that is more forward-looking, um, and that is able to adapt to the unexpected. Um, and we've termed this within Accra as flexible forward decision-making. It doesn't really matter what you want to call it. As long as the principles within FFDM of flexible forward-looking decision-making are encouraged, then hopefully um, this can help us make better decisions about the future. Um, and what we recognized is through the first phase uh, of, of the ACRA program was that, that we wanted really to encourage or enhance, help people to enhance their adaptive capacity, their ability to be able to adapt to climate change or whatever. It doesn't really matter. To, to be able to adapt to change. Um, so what we did was break it down to the core characteristics. What is it that makes a person, a community, a local government able to adapt to change. And so we identified five characteristics and came up with this framework of, of local adaptive capacity. It breaks it down into your asset base, the institutions and entitlements that you have, um, the knowledge and information you have available to you, your ability to encourage and foster innovation. And then the last one was around flexible forward-looking decision-making. 
And this is what we took as an entry point. We recognized that adaptive capacity similar to resilience covers almost everything. I mean, it's essentially the whole of the development sector. Um, so we wanted to see where we could feasibly add, add value, look at uh, an intervention that we could bring about and see whether that has worked. So that entry point came through FFDM, recognizing that it would interact with all of these other characteristics of adaptive capacity. So what is FFDM? Again, it's, you, know, you, you can talk about resilience in the same way. It, it's something that's fuzzy, it's conceptual. Um, it's relatively easy to explain in a, in, a, in a simple conceptual term, but in practice it's very hard. But what we wanted to do is sort of break it down a little bit. Um, in doing so, we sort of identified principles that we would associate with uh, decision-making that is flexible and that is forward-looking. First of all, that you have to recognize that change will happen, change, uh, <coughs> and that sort of development and development trajectories won't remain linear. Um, this requires yeah, that you embrace uncertainty, embrace change, um, and that adaptation will happen, even if you don't know the direction of whatever change will, will be brought about. The second is to reason where possible about the, the impacts that that change will have on your development trajectories. Identify different drivers of change that are most important to you. Um, and then thirdly, to identify the enablers that you would need to be able to adapt, trying to overcome barriers, um, which in many of these country contexts we're talking about are relatively large. And fourthly, um, you, you can consider yourself relatively flexible and forward-looking if you can, where needed, bring about changes to the structures um, and your planning processes that you need to be able to adapt, whether that's incrementally or to bring about wholesale transformation. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's, you know, that, that last part is the hard bit, uh, and very few people can actually do this. Um, if we're talking about uh, national government structures, even local government structures, to be able to bring change to these, uh, you know, the ways that people work is very, very hard. Um, so we have to be realistic about what we can achieve through trying to promote uh, an approach or a tool. <coughs> so again, just to repeat that, as it, you know, as, as a concept, it's something that is, is straightforward to to explain uh, in in its simplest terms. But in practice, you know, we struggle in in, in taking that into the real world, right? And again, I keep going, coming back to the example of, of something like resilience or or adaptation. You know, people who work day in, day out on resilience or adaptation, we struggle ourselves to describe how it relates to, to the real world. What in practice you need to be doing to be more resilient. I'm just as guilty as anybody else here in doing that. Um, so what we need really um, is, 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 is tools that help us communicate some of this complexity. Help people to understand why we think it's important that they consider these new approaches. Um, and help them to, to help themselves, in a sense, identify ways forward in trying to achieve them. And the important thing to recognize here is that, that there's no one way, and, and that's why it's hard to, for us to translate and, and, and give a guide as to how to promote these concepts, because in, in different contexts it will be different. You, you don't have a, a, a roadmap for delivering um, flexible, forward-looking decision-making in the same way that you don't have a roadmap for resilience. Um, it will be different in different contexts. So that's how we came across the idea of using a game. And uh, games have, in the development sector, actually been use more and more, actually in adaptation, particularly through the Red Cross, have really been pioneering this approach. And we were quite excited. It's an, it, it allows us to be able to communicate something that's complex <coughs> without having to go into abstract terms, without having to, to go into the theories behind it, but people can get stuck in uh, and, and to try and experience it themselves, realize that there's a problem, realize that they have to do something about it and change that. And they do that with, with their own emotions. They invest themselves in the game. You're a winner or you're a loser. and, and that. Know, that, that really has a strong emotion, um, and people take that away. So what did we do? Uh, two things. First of all, we wanted to see whether FFDM actually makes any difference to anybody, whether it resonates with people at, at the local level. That's the most important thing. The second was to, once you've established that it might be, to design, to trial, and to document uh, a game or a game-enabled reflection approach um, that could help to promote this and could help people realize how to actually go about uh, achieving a more flexible and forward-looking decision-making process. Uh, we did it in three districts, um, one in Uganda, ooh, <laughs> one in Ethiopia, uh, and one in Mozambique. And what does it look like? It, a little bit like this. It's a player's eye view of what it is. It's a board game, essentially. Uh, it takes two days. So I wouldn't play it down the pub with your mates, <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> it depends what you're into. Um, <laughs> but essentially, you're, you're a district. As each player is a district, you have development cards, so they have... Uh, certain investment choices. I can invest in tree growth. I can invest in new school. Um, each of which will have different benefits over different timescales. Uh, and you are therefore, you have your different por portfolio or strategy of, of different development interventions, uh, and you go along your normal year. 
sometimes it's a normal year. There are no, there are no extremes, nothing happens. You reap the benefits of, of what you've invested in. Other times you have a shock. So you'll spin the little wheel. Uh, one out of six times, there's a flood. If you haven't invested in, pr in preparatory measures, you will suffer. You won't lose everything, or it depends on the, the sort of shock that you'd have, but you will lose a little bit of your development, you know, development points as we call them. So that goes along, and then after a little while, uh, the risks change, bearing in mind that climate change might be a factor in, in 10, 20 years' time. So you're now in 20 years ahead in the future. It's no longer one in six, it's one in three. So again, you, know, you have to think very carefully about the way that you're strategizing, about the way that you've invested in your development portfolio. Um, and again, it is very emotional. People get very invested in this. After two days, you know, you've built up all of your, uh, you know, your town district cars, and then bam, they get wiped out. Um, in, case you, you know, in, in cases where you haven't actually prepared for. So that's the idea. I'm going to be quiet for a bit and let you actually see, hopefully, what it looks like or how we played it. Uh, I'm hoping this works. Right now I'm in Kotido in the Karamoja area and we are here facilitating a training on Accra Game. And uh, Accra Game is about flexible and forward-looking decision-making, which is very interesting. Yeah, I invested in a clinic and I have seen that at least I have cut down the mortality rate of my population. So I am again investing in my clinic. So if you, if you invest here, you will also benefit from this year. So I encourage you. Mine was just about the factory. That was two years. Mm -hmm. It is now over. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you want to start now? I want to... Yeah, the game which uh, Accra came up with. As I was playing it, actually, I felt a lot of emotions. I felt uh, so much anxiety. I was feeling, am I really going to get it right? Are we going the right direction? One of them is that we, all of you are going to be protected. I have one shield and that is a protection for all, all the districts. I put a factor because I'll and, and I also get some money. So the other plan is that I want to make sure uh, three plans it takes place. Now after playing the game, I realized that it is very important that district governments should put into consideration the, the events that are likely to happen uh, and then should balance risk shielding and then development ambitions. If we complete this project, we get two times. You could not understand exactly what we were going through this game. It looked funny, it looked like a waste of time, but when we practically started using the cards, using the investment points, using the time, using the group things, it actually opened up my mind to begin to say, wow, this is the best way. One can plan, one can uh, integrate issues of environment into the development plan. We now lose two years. Yes, one year. We are going to invest <laughs> in the hospital. The card has been saved with severe drugs. During the gameplay, ideas which came into my mind we are the process of planning, the process of decision making, the process of you know interacting. We, the, there was one particular interesting part was the, the group. A group project that looked like as if oh I think if we work as a group like this we can make things move. As a facilitator, I think uh, this was now again another wonderful moment, looking at people 
concentrating with tight faces and then all of a sudden releasing their faces in joy after uh, realizing that they are being shielded. But then the uncertainty of the events when they come, you see a, 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 a mood that is not friendly. And most amazingly, they learn lessons you know, of sharing ideas in planning. The game will help us now uh, really focus on what is on the, on the ground and also plan in such a way that uh, we include other areas, uh, uh, networking and partnerships. Yeah. <laughs> because climate change is actually increasing, yeah. the impacts are increasing. How protected are you against drought? Yeah. 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 We anticipate that this game training is going to help local governments in terms of uh, better planning to integrate uh, priority sectors into their development plans. And after this training, we know that if we continue with the support, it will improve the planning at local government level. A game for a workshop. That is the best way to go now. OK, so hopefully that gave you a little idea as to the sorts of things, the sorts of emotions, the sort of activities that, that happened through this, this game-enabled reflection approach. And I think the thing that you didn't really pick up there was the reflection bit. It was a lot of the game. But actually, more important than the game, or just as important than the game, is to be able to translate what you've just done, how you just, you just played, your strategies, who's won, who's lost, how to translate that into the real world. Um, what does that mean in real life? Um, and if you just play, you know, if you just play the game, it, it, it's in a sense your, your time has just been wasted. Because um, it's very hard, therefore, to, you know, to, to actually take that next step, um, recognizing that what we're trying to do here is to promote um, things that are, you know, are relevant to real people and to, to real world situations. Um, I'm being shouted at Eva to, to hurry it up, so I'll try. Um, in terms of the research that we did, um, it was very much a mixed methods approach. We, we tried to do at different stages, different bits. So we had a, a political economy analysis that we did in each of the districts um, before we went in to try and identify who the key actors are, um, how change actually happens at the district level. Um, we, we did key informant interviews with, with lots of people there um, within the districts before we came in, and then we had a panel survey where we were asking the same questions to the same people who were taking part in the workshops um, before, uh, just afterwards, and then we came back after five to nine months as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. I'll give you a little snippet of some of the stuff because most of the, the research findings are in the, the larger reports or in terms of the, the more of the data. Um, everybody loves graphs, so I thought I'd put a graph up. Um, this is a, a, diver a diverging um, box plot. Uh, it shows, or it's, it's helpful in showing um, sort of shifts in people's attitudes when you're asking them questions. So you've got the three stages of the survey. Um, if you're, so it's all aligned towards the middle or towards the moderate for the, um, so if you're more towards the right, then you've answered it more around the extremely very, and if it's more towards the left, then it's not at all and slightly. And we're looking for shifts here. Um, and when we're asking people how confident they are, um, you can see, and it's very similar actually across all three of the countries, this, uh, this plan, you've got this starting off at a low baseline, um, up to a high point, and then bouncing back to somewhere in between. Um, and that's very much to be expected, um, especially if you're introducing a new concept then that they're, they're relatively unfamiliar with. Um, interestingly that I chose this one, actually this one's Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, people's emotional ranges seem to be very limited. Um, the video was in Uganda, and you can see it wasn't actually scripted, <laughs> but people are much more animate. They're much more uh, yeah. open to, to someone coming in and doing something and trying something new. In Ethiopia, it was very different. Um, people were very skeptical. They were a little <coughs> bit standoffish, and that very much reflects in the survey results. Um, and there are other different trends as well. I'll, I'll, I was going to point out the other ones, but it's not just that sort of low to high to bounce back. Um, uh, but if you're interested in some of the, the, the more of the results um, side of things in the surveys, please look at the online report. Um, we've got we've got a, a whole swathe of different um, outputs from that. Uh, in terms of what we actually learned from having done the research, um, most importantly, um, that this this concept, not necessarily this this the name or whatever, but the principles that came through under flexible forward-looking decision making, <coughs> really does resonate with people um, at the local level. Um, they saw it as a useful tool for them to be able to, to, to uncover new opportunities and, most importantly, new collaborations. Saskia talked before about these links with, with the Met Office and, and local decision-making. That was a really key part, and that happened very much after um, opening people's minds as to the things that they can do, even within the constraints that they operate within, and that was the most important bit. Um, the most, yeah, uh, again, probably the biggest take-home message is, is that 
despite that, uh, the fact that, they, that it resonates with them, they still operate within uh, a political economy context that is, is limiting. There are significant barriers. Um, and these barriers are actually very similar in all three of these countries. Um, you've got a very top-down uh, sort of central pro uh, planning process. So the central government hands down uh, financial um, targets, it hands down structures for which local government then has to spend all of its money. Um, agency within, that, within those district development um, uh, players is very limited. So they have very little control as to what they can spend outside of those central allocations. Um, and most importantly for us, I think, is that there's a, there really is a lack of incentives um, for people to act on disaster risk reduction or climate change. It falls outside of the central priorities. These are normally education, water, uh, housing, that, you know, the core things um, that we traditionally associate with development. Things that are more towards the fringe are more, if you, know, if you have a champion who, who, would, who, who wants to take on board these issues, then it gets addressed. If not, it's left out. So these are really important things that, that we found in trying to, to understand how decisions are made uh, and, and how the planning process at this local level happens. Um, I mentioned before about the difference in, in uptake and enthusiasm. That was, that's really <coughs> noted. Um, Ethiopia, very much, two minutes, wow, uh, very much uh, more restricted in that sense. Mozambique uh, and Uganda were very happy for people to come in, were very happy to, to look at new approaches and, and to take them on board. Um, in one interesting thing that we, that we found was that when we came back after nine months and did the interviews, when we asked people, what is flexible forward-looking decision-making to you? Um, they associated it with collaboration, with, with coordination, um, less so with actual flexibility and, and long-term planning. So, the, you know, the, the meanings through which that they they'd remembered and, and tried to enact FFDM was um, was slightly skewed. But again, I think that partly reflects the fact that collaboration and coordination these are things that they can do within the confines of, of the structures that they have. This long-term planning is very much out of their hands um, to a certain extent. Um, the other thing was is it's. Uh, Using the game or using this approach was very effective in changing people's attitudes towards barriers. So when you approach people, particularly at the beginning, um, they're very conscious to sort of say, well, you know, we can't do anything about this. We have these, these systems that we operate within. It's not our fault. We can't change anything. Um, doing something like this game's approach actually helped in, in, in people perceiving that they actually can do something, that they have this wiggle room that we call it. This, they can do things within the confines of the systems that they operate within. Whether that's something very small, you know, getting hold of your Met Office, asking them to translate the outputs that they, they, they normally give to a language or, or a context that's more appropriate to, to where they are. That's something that they can do. It doesn't take a huge amount of financial resources. Um, you know, doing it, uh, improving your disaster management strategy, your plan, making it more forward-looking instead of just reactive. That's something that doesn't, again, take a huge amount of resources and can happen internally. Um, we also learned that <laughs> Surprise, surprise, communicating an abstract concept is difficult. Um, it would be the same problem if we, <coughs> if we tried to promote resilience. Um, but what the game allowed us to do was um, to help people understand it, make it relevant to them in their real world. I mean, we, we very much was, uh, had a, had a hands-off approach. Um, so we introduced what we thought FFDM was, um, we played the game, and actually allowed people to experience what they thought the principles were through having run it. Um, so it's very much a two-way type of exchange. It's not a one-way. Uh, and I think people really bounced off that, and that was, that was a very significant part of um, why it was successful, in, in, in a sense, or partly successful. Um, and then the key one again here is that, you know, whatever you do, it's, it, it takes financial resources, it takes time investments. You can't change something as big as this um, with a game. You can't change it with a workshop. Um, you can't change it in two to three years, to be frank. It, it, it takes a long-term engagement, and you can't implement something, expect to follow up, and find it completely changed. Um, what we tried to do was to, to instigate the, this approach, this workshop, and then have capacity building activities based off, off the back of that, um, trying to identify what communities need first. And they were able to, to identify that. We provided support in certain districts, helping them to change their district development plans completely after they'd asked for it. Um, but again, you know, you can't, you can't just implement isolated uh, interventions and expect things to completely change. So you have to be quite realistic about what you can actually deliver. In terms of the, the sort of the key messages and the recommendations, I think it's been mentioned by everyone here, but you know, this, um, I think we really want to, to ram home the message of the political context really is key in delivering change. Um, that political economy analysis that we did at the beginning was so vital um, to helping us understand how change happens. Um, if we went in blind without understanding, first of all, that 
that the champions of change and the political buy-in from the top was really important, that would have changed, you know, that, that significantly changed our approach. Um, in a sense, to be frank, we could have had, we could have run the game with four people. If we'd have had the head of the district, district planner, and a couple of other people that he listens to, or he or she listens to, that would have been just as effective as having everybody there. Because in, in that context, that's how decisions get made. It's a very top-down model. It might be different in other contexts, but that's, that's the case. So having this, this appreciation, understanding how things work at the local level really is important. Um, the second thing about investing in better communication, I think for, for all of the approaches that we're trying to promote, you know, we really can reap dividends through, through investing in different tools, through trying new innovative techniques in trying to communicate some of these complex issues. Um, you know, <coughs> things like uh, adaptation, things like resilience are really hard to grapple with particularly for people who don't work on them day in, day out. I mean, they're hard enough for people that do. Um, thirdly, that, that trying to bring about change in people's attitudes, people's in, in the institutional structures that they work within is slow. I sort of mentioned this before. It comes back to this issue of, of longer term funding, really, you know, that not just funding, but the way that we, we go about trying to identify community priorities, the way that we go about trying to deliver the interventions that we, that we deliver, uh, and, and how we fund them, how we deliver those ME structures. Um, and lastly, very interesting for us, because we're ODI as, as, as researchers, but also that we're very interested in, in, in supporting capacity building activities, we found quite a strong trade-off was needed. Um, on the one hand, we want to ensure that we've got rigorous research. On the other, we want to make sure that that research is taken up and it helps to influence the capacity building um, activities that were going on. Uh, you know, at the beginning, we had these perhaps naive uh, you know, ambitions of trying to make sure that we have one process that stays the same so we can evaluate that that uh, we can replicate it in lots of different districts, we can do a randomized control trial, see if different districts are affected in the same way, um, that got thrown out the window pretty quickly. Um, you, you have to real, you know, in, in a collaborative co-production type style of, 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 of partnership that we we're trying to engage in, we have to recognize that, you know, bits of the research will take a hit, but we'll also make sure that, that we're maintaining that core research element and that, that it's informing um, a capacity building activity. So you've got that trade-off and it's, it's not always easy. And there are points where you know, we've had pretty big fights between Oxfam and ODI and all the different partners to, to sort of identify where we thought we were comfortable in, in, in those trade-offs. Lastly, sorry, I'm going over a little bit. Um, trying to promote these principles, we call it flexible forward-looking decision-making. Again, it doesn't really matter what you want to call it. Um, it doesn't have to be a new standalone approach. Um, embed it into others, embed it into resilience, into adaptation whatever tools you want. As long as these principles are being taken up, that's more than fine. Um, I think what we found is that it has a lot of good messages for um, adaptation. So the, I mean, that's the, the field that I, that I normally associate myself with. Um, but there's a lot that can be learned from adaptation planning and the way that we promote adaptation um, that we learned off the back of this. First of all, that um, <clears throat> there will always be uncertainty with the future. I think within the adaptation world, um, we're sometimes a bit too eager to promote um, that we know how the, uh, the future outlooks will, will be. You know, we promote um, certain uh, scenarios, certain trajectories of future, whether that's climate change or otherwise. Um, we have to embrace uncertainty in some of those projections and have to recognize that in many contexts, we can't tell exactly what um, the future will be like. Um, the other one is extending adaptation well beyond climate change. Um, we often tell people, okay, here's the scenario, here's the, the climate scenario, but completely disregard you know, other really important um, drivers of change, whether that's population. I mean, many of these places, when you're talking about water resources, population is more important um, than climate change in these near-term um, timescales. Um, bridging the national with the local, those relationships are incredibly important, especially if you're working with government. Um, making sure the incentives are there to actually act on adaptation, to act on promoting more flexible and forward-looking planning, is, is, is that's how you deliver the change. Um, and the last point, um, is, is considering alternative pathways. So recognizing that change, in many sense, linear change um, is, is, is not the right way of doing things. We have to be able to accept um, that, there will be that we have to have contingencies, um, that there will be uncertainties, and that we may have to change um, the course of our development tra trajectories if they're not to be maladapted. Um, so that's a whistle-stop tour of the ACRA program. Sorry, it took a little bit longer than either would have liked. Um, if you're interested in more, please look at the, uh, at the full report online. Um, and there's some other ones there that, that are up on, um, that we've done throughout the course of the last four years.